Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. The GET team of the Bertelsmann Stiftung has recently published a new studies on a potential trade deal between the EU and India and today we want to look more into this. What we are going to do is that um, I am going to give a brief introduction. My name is Christian Blut and I'm a project manager in the, Bertels, in the GET team of the Bertelsmann Stiftung and then I'm going to a hand to my colleague Cora Jungblut who is going to introduce to the study in more detail after which we'll, we are going to hear from our colleague Murali Nair who is giving us a little more background and also an Indian uh, perspective on this policy issue. Um, at, after that, of course, the last point will be a Q&A. Um, please feel free to post questions at any time during uh, this webinar by using the questions function in your uh, menu. The Bertelsmann Stiftung is the largest private operating foundation in Germany. It focuses on areas such as the economy, education, healthcare, civil society and culture. The Bertelsmann Stiftung has offices in Washington and Brussels as part of its internationalization strategy and uh, the Global Economic Dynamics Project, which is part of the Bertelsmann Stiftung, examines the causes and effects of economic trends and has a major focus on international trade and investment. The EU and India are important trade partners. India is currently the EU's ninth largest trading partner. On the other hand, for India, the EU is the largest trading partner. In 2016, reciprocal, reciprocal trade volumes for goods stood around 77 billion euros. But there is definitely more potential here. With trade barriers persisting on both sides, tariff a free trade agreement could lead to a reduction of tariffs and so-called non-tariff barriers, which would achieve considerable welfare gains. However, the EU and India have already been negotiating such an agreement since 2007, um, but so far with only limited success, and negotiations have stalled since 2013. After Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Europe earlier this week, Hopes are high again that the EU and India will resume official negotiations on the agreement. But even if this were not to happen, most sides could still have a range of hurdles and challenges to overcome before a conclusion of a trade deal would be conceivable. If the EU and India succeed in concluding a comprehensive free trade agreement, um, they could reap considerable economic benefits as shown by the study we are presenting today and um, on which we are going to elaborate in a minute. Um, let me hand over to my colleague Cora Jungblut who will go into more detail talking about uh, the uh, recent study we have published. Oh, thanks for this, Christian, your introduction uh, um, to today's topic. Uh, what I'm going to do is to present uh, some of the results of our recent study on uh, the trade deal between the EU and India, which has been under negotiation, as Christian said, uh, since 2007 already. First of all, let's have a look at uh, the role of um, the EU28 and India in global trade. Um, to see that when it comes to merchandise trade, uh, we could say that we have a giant versus barb here, since uh, the European Union ranks second uh, when it comes to global exports, whereas India, despite the size of its economy, only ranks 19th. Looking at the bilateral trade between uh, EU and India, as Christian said, India ranks ninth for the EU, whereas the EU is uh, the number one trade partner for India. The free trade agreement has been under negotiation for almost 10 years now and negotiations have even stalled since 2013 due to conflicting interests in uh, various areas which I come um, back to later. 
in 2016, both sides committed themselves again to having this uh, free trade agreement in the future. And as Christian mentioned initially, trade um, played a very important role when Modi was in, in Germany uh, at the beginning of this week. But still, until today, official negotiations have not been resumed. Looking at the key challenges why negotiations have been stalled, we have a range of issues on the EU side as well as on the Indian side. Uh, the European Union would like to see substantial tariff reductions in some industries uh, where European businesses have a competitive advantage such as automotive industry but also spirits where uh, Indian tariffs are rather high still. Of course, improved market access, for example, in the services sector or in public procurement plays an important role from the EU's perspective too, to open um, Indian markets for European businesses. For these, intellectual property rights are an important issue in, in India as well, especially when it comes to pharmaceuticals, for example, um, where IPR protection from um, an EU view, of course, uh, is not uh, um, not that good currently. And um, the investment court system, which is um, part of the European Union's demands, um, is uh, difficult to negotiate from the Indian perspective, since uh, India would like uh, does not really want to see legislation outside the Indian framework. From India's perspective, we have similar issues, for example, um, improved market access in these sectors where um, Indian business have a competitive edge vis-a-vis -vis European companies such as textiles and apparel. But there are also other issues such as um, the acceptance as data as a cure nation, which would facilitate the data flow between the two countries. And currently, India is not accepted as data as a cure nation. Um, from the side of the European Union. Another issue um, refers to the transfer of Indian professionals, for example, from the IT sector to the European Union um, with short-term visas. And uh, India would like to see the procedures for these, uh, this kind of temporary visas facilitated through this agreement. And as we all know, India still is an emerging economy. So for India, it's very important to have enough flexibility to cushion uh, any, any negative effects that might occur from an agreement with a very developed uh, region such as the European Union and to allow um, to cope with these effects, for example, um, when it comes to job losses. So we see that both sides uh, still have a range of issues to um, discuss and consider before they can resume and conclude negotiations on the FTA. But if we turn to the economic effects of um, this FTA, we will see that both sides could profit from this kind of agreement. Before I come to uh, the concrete results, I would like to um, show you how to read and better understand the results of our study. So if we talk about economic effects of free trade agreement between the EU and, and India, we're talking about effects on real GDP, value added uh, on the sectoral level, and trade effects, that is uh, the change in exports and imports between the two partners of the FTA. And the effects we are talking about, the detailed numbers, refer to the gap you see here um, in this chart. This taking uh, the level of Germany's GDP as an example shows with the blue line below the development of Germany's GDP over the time without an FTI between the EU and India. And the red line shows the effect of the free trade agreement. So if we talk about the effects, um, we talk about effects after they have come fully into play, which is at uh, the time period two. And the gap is uh, the two-headed blue arrow you see here. So all the effects I will refer to in a minute refer to this um, gap in development over the time. Now let's jump into the income effect, that is the effect on real GDP in the uh, EU 28, but also in India and selected third countries. 
selected third countries are outsiders of the trade pact, which are not members of it. So one can see that starting from a low level, of course, India sees the highest absolute welfare gains um, when the effects of the FTA come fully into play. But India's per capita gain is only half the average of the European Union's member states, uh, which also is due to um, the European Union starting from a much higher level of GDP, whereas India's GDP, of course, is much lower. So we again see here we have a, a very developed region and an emerging economy on the other side. Looking at uh, the EU28 member states now, we find that the UK and Germany see high, the highest absolute gains uh, from the FTA, which uh, talking about the UK, of course, we have all the historical ties with India. And uh, for Germany, this does not come as a surprise either, since Germany is the most important trade partner of India in the European Union. Talking about um, per capita gains, Belgium and Ireland see the highest ones. And this is due to the fact that Belgium is a major place of entry and exit for imports from and exports to India. And Ireland is strongly connected to India via services trade and would therefore stand to benefit from lower non-tariff barriers in this area. And if you look at the changes um, of GDP across all EU member states, we also find that there are no negative income effects for insiders to this trade deal. Um, and it is important to note that this is by no means an automatic outcome of the model. It could also be that some of the members of a free trade agreement might um, experience uh, negative effects, which is not the case with this agreement. And now, um, last but not least, have a look at, out, uh, at effects for outsiders. And we see here that negative effects for these are um, stati statistically insignificant. So all in all, the world would kind of benefit from this trade deal and um, third countries are not um, left behind to a major degree, which also is not a matter of course um, when it comes to this kind of free trade agreements. Looking now um, at the trade effects, just a br brief glimpse into the development of exports and imports between um, the EU and India. We see that actually the, the FTA could really boost um, trade between the two regions, which is due to the fact that there still are um, a major, major obstacles and hurdles hampering the trade flow between the two countries. So exports from the European Union to India could arise um, by a three-digit number, more than 100%, and vice versa. Imports from India to the EU 28 could rise by about 90%. So um, a real boost in trade between the two regions could be expected. In the end, let's have a look at uh, the sectoral effects, where you usually find winners and losers of the trade deals, even though on the national level, the aggregate level, um, you see uh, the positive effects. And what we see here is that uh, the gains of the European Union um, sectors in value added partly mirror India's losses. As you see here, for example, on the winning side in the European Union, we see machinery and equipment, motor vehicles and minerals, where European businesses are very strong competitors. And you see that exactly these sectors are on the losing side in India. And vice versa, you see that business services like IT, for example, um, which India is famous for now, and textiles or apparels, are on the winning side in India, but on the losing side in the European Union. So this points to a stronger specialization um, on both sides in case the FTA is concluded and comes into effect, which from an economic perspective is a classic comparative advantage, which is, um, so to say, good on the one hand, but has disadvantages for uh, the economies involved as well, because it implies a structural change and the sectors which are on the losing side might uh, suffer from job losses. So these effects would have to be cushioned 
in India, but also in the European Union. So if we're talking about FTAs and economic effects, we always have to think of um, the impact of these trade deals beyond economic effects and also see the strategic value of a um, trade deal between the EU and India. And in a time of Trump and Brexit, this kind of trade deal um, is a good signal for free trade in general, which has, after all, over the decades lifted million people out of poverty. So free trade in general still is um, a good thing for the global economy and free trade agreements try to set a framework to boost um, um, free trade between different nations. For the European Union, um, the FTA would be an important step towards Asia, especially given the fact that the transatlantic relationship is not as, as stable as it used to be. So this could be a very important thing for the EU trade policy. For India, the FTA offers the chance to strengthen ties with its most important trade partner, which would be good for um, the development of the country too. But as I um, mentioned initially, we are dealing here with a trade agreement between a developed region and an emerging economy and there still are diverging interests. So um, both sides have to find ways to get over, to overcome the hurdles um, still inside and try to, in a first step, resume official negotiations for the FDA before it can, uh, can be concluded in the first place. So um, to sum up, um, it's very um, obvious that both sides still have a long way ahead before they can conclude this trade deal. So I hope I could give you um, a brief glimpse into the results of our study. And without further ado, I hand back over to Christian. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Cora. I would now like to give the word to our colleague Murali Nia, uh, who is going to give us a little more background. Morali, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Christian. If you could move over to the next slide, that would be great. Yes. Um, so uh, before I go into the details, um, day before yesterday I was in Berlin um, where there was the Indo-German Business Summit where Modi and Merkel gave statements. and. Um, Merkel said in her statements that they would look forward to uh, this free trade agreement negotiation starting again. And I was hoping that Modi would reflect or reciprocate uh, the statement, which he did not in, in, in his speech. And the next day in the papers, there were a lot of reports on, on the headlines usually went in the direction of Merkel, not just Modi, due to get the free trade agreement discussions going on. So. Um, in that sense, we do see that there is a lot of interest from the EU, or in this case, from the German side, but India seems to be needing a bit more conviction to move forward. So by looking at the country, um, I mean, I would start by looking at two sectors. One, where the most gains, one of the most, or the sector which has one of the most gains from this free trade agreement, and one where there would be more losses from that. So the sector, um, which seems to be gaining the most is this combination of textile and apparel industry. And if you look at it, it is a major employer, so 45 million employees are working in this sector, contributing to 4% of GDP and it accounts for 15% of all exports. Now, uh, this is not a peanut, so this is a big number for India, but it is a sector which is being threatened by automation. So that would mean that the numbers are good for the time being, but it's probably a question of time before a lot of these production are going to move back to um, industrialized countries. And this is something which India can do almost nothing about, because on one hand you do have competition from neighboring South Asian or Southeast Asian countries. You take uh, Vietnam or Bangladesh, which are also strong, and the cost of labor is comparable or sometimes cheaper than that of India. And on the other hand, you do have competition from digitalization. So if you say, or I mean, from an Indian perspective, the EU says this is a sector you're going to gain. So the Indian perspective would be, yeah, for the time being, yes, we agree. 
but these gains are probably not the sustainable over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And if you look at the sector which is going to lose the most, um, or one of the sectors that will lose the most is the automotive industry. And this is something which is of crucial importance to India, the sector, because there has been a national policy on um, automotive industry since 2006, and where they've met most of the targets, surprisingly, for considering India's economy growth. Because um, it accounts for 7% of GDP, I mean, almost a fourth of manufacturing happens in the automobile sector. 19 million employees, if you add the direct and indirect employees, um, uh, are working on this sector. And if you compare to the textile industry, I can't give you a number, but in terms of skill set, in terms of uh, salary levels, they are much higher. So it's, it's a more highly skilled, um, better paid job that are being lost considering the gain of textile sector with low skilled, low salary expectation. So Indian automobile industry has been growing and it's set to overtake Germany next year as the fourth largest automobile industry or uh, sector in the world. Uh, but interesting enough, um, India has been exporting more cars to Germany as uh, the number of cars being imported from Germany to India. Of course, not looking at the value of these cars which are being imported or exported. So the question is, would India want to give up a sector which has a lot of promise in the future for a sector which does not hold that much of um, a promise? Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Christian. Yeah, and second thing which I always try to um, go through in, in all discussions is that treating India as a country um, is, is a false assumption. So this chart which basically puts different states of India according to the HDI scores of the Human Development Index from the United Nations. So if you break that up, you do see uh, states like Kerala in the south of India uh, having a, a ranking similar to that of a country like Maldives to Bihar, which is the same as that of Myanmar. So it is a very diverse country, both economically as well as politically. Because if you look at uh, manufacturing base and investments, states in the western part of India, like Gujarat and Maharashtra, they, they top the list. Um, and they are very strong in sectors like, like automobile or machinery. And there are states like Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh and Bihar, where they are not industrially strong. So that means that if you aggregate the economic interest at the national level, you're covering a spectrum from very low productive agriculture to cutting edge manufacturing or IT and business services. Now you could argue that it is similar for the EU if you look at Eastern European countries and Western European countries, but the divergence or the disparity in India is extremely high. Now if you collate all these interests at the national level and, and then have a negotiation with an equally complicated partner like EU, that makes uh, negotiations really difficult, given the best of the intentions. Um, and not to forget, more than 600 million people, almost 53% of Indian population are still dependent on agriculture. Now, these people have to be shifted into industry at some point or the other, because this level of dependence uh, on agriculture for employment is not sustainable for any economy in the world. Now, the question is with increasing digitalization, how are these people going to find employment in which sectors? And these are questions which India needs to answer for itself before opening up its market to the EU. And I think India is far away from finding this answer. Um, the second aspect of this economic disparity is also that the thinking at national level, if you look at the Indian bureaucrats, um, I mean, I can't say for all of them, but most of them have been molded in this Nehruvian socialism, so it's like Fabian socialism mentality where they feel that infant industry has to be protected for it to grow and become competitive at a global level. I mean, this has been proven right for many countries historically and also for India. The automobile sector in India was heavily protected and that gave rise to a, a generation of tier two, tier three suppliers, which have now become tier one suppliers and supplying to the whole world and becoming global players on their own. And now, how do you convince a bureaucrat who has seen this development to say that, hey, now you need to open up and to, to be successful at a global level? There are exceptions like the IT industry, which probably because the government did not protect it or government did not care about it, they went on and became successful at a very level playing field. But 
this is the only story that we have in India of uh, a globally successful industry growing despite any support from uh, the government. Now, Cora did mention about the need for mobility of Indian IT professionals. I do not see the Indian government going soft on this issue because they are seeing problems in the US with Trump because uh, the Trump government has come up with new regulations which control the number of IT professionals in the H1B, which is a highly skilled sector. And we're already seeing some impact of that on the growth of IT industries. And that means that where they can have a leverage, the Indian government would try to, and I don't see them being soft on this issue. Um, but on the positive side, I mean, if you look at Brexit, uh, where we do see that I think um, almost 43% of all Indian trade and investment in the EU goes to the UK as a base to enter continental Europe. And now if this route is blocked through Brexit, Indian companies will be forced to be present in continental Europe. And that means that uh, a free trade agreement would easen up that process. And this would be a good way to, to convince the Indians or the Indian negotiators that a free trade agreement is in their interest considering the imminent Brexit scenario. Uh, the last point that I would like to make is that of demonetization. Uh, some of you might know about it, but for those who do not, uh, on the 8th of November 2016, the Indian government declared or canceled the validity of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes, which form almost 85% of the Indian currency. So overnight, most of the currencies were not valid anymore. So this created, uh, I mean, of course, the image was that of um, fighting corruption, and this led to success in regional elections for the BJP government. But on the other hand, there are different studies which show that more than 400,000 jobs have been lost, especially in the informal sector. So uh, this sort of a one-time political gain, despite a huge economic impact, is something I doubt the Modi government would want to do again. Now, if we look at the free trade agreement and you see that the automobile sector is one of the sectors which would suffer from, uh, from the deal, um, and there are no immediate positive impact, it would take some time for the growth in other sectors to materialize, this could be a political risk um, which the Modi government might or might not be willing to take. Uh, the reason uh, also that if you look at uh, non-tariff discussions like intellectual property rights, there, uh, there are very hardened stands on generic drugs and uh, compulsive uh, licensing of certain pharmaceutical products. So, uh, so there are politically very, uh, highly sensitive issues in India. The question is how much of it would translate into political gain for the BJP government and what could convince them to take ne negotiations forward. I would stop at this point in time and I think uh, I can talk on and on about India and the political uh, aspect of the straight uh, negotiation, uh, but I think it will be more interesting if I uh, gather some questions from your end and then try to address it in a more focused way. Thank you, Murali. Um, we do already have some questions, but uh, let me use this opportunity to remind our participants that at any point in time, you can write a question into the question section of your control panel, and we'll deal with it um, as soon as we can. Um, we have one question that is asking um, how the beneficial trade effects are split between traditional liberalization issues such as the reduction of tariffs and more comprehensive issues such as the reduction of uh, non-tariff barriers to trade and uh, openness of public procurement, etc. Um, I think that's probably a question that I would like to give to Cora to answer. So um, let me hand the floor to you, Cora. Thank you, Christian. Thank you uh, for the question. Um, of course, I could only give a very well comprehensive um, overview of the results um, of our study, which dives much more deeply into these issues. And um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this before, can be downloaded for free from our uh, website ged-project.de and um, as for the question itself, we actually differentiated between different scenarios from which you can derive, I assume at least, the answer to this question. Um, if 
the FTA um, only eliminated uh, tariffs and did not go for the reduction of NTMs, the per, per capita um, income increase for India and the European Union would be much, much lower. So you can see that uh, a large chunk of the effects um, are due to NTMs. Uh, for the concrete numbers, um, India, um, if only tariffs were eliminated, India would only uh, see a per capita income increase by 0 0.3 US dollars, whereas it sees $22 um, for the deep FTA, including the reduction of NTMs. For the European Union, um, tariffs play a more important role because they are higher in India. The European Union, 28, um, still would see um, a per capita income increase for about six dollars, only tariffs eliminated, compared with uh, forty-four point three dollars when we go for a deep FTI. I hope this um, answers the question. And there is a, a table in the in the full text of the study uh, showing the decomposition of the income effects um, of different scenario of the FTA. And if you drop me a line, I can send you the full text of the study with the page. We have a good amount of questions coming in now, so thank you to our participants for that. Um, there's one other question which I'd uh, like to hand to Cora since she's just been speaking. Um, we have a question how these figures would change if the UK were outside the EU. Would um, that change the effects? Um, we actually did a, a small scenario um, on a Brexit, how it would affect uh, the uh, FTA between the EU and India and what we can see here is that um, the value of the FTA for India would sink by about one-fifth for India and uh, for the European Union it's um, it's very uh, well differentiated between the different member states. There actually are member states uh, like Germany which would profit more from the FTA without the UK because they would not have uh, UK companies as competitors anymore so some uh, uh, member states of the European Union, 27 then, would uh, see higher gains with the Brexit. For India, um, the value would definitely sink. But one has to say that as far as I know, the UK is very strict about the regulations concerning temporary visa for IT uh, professionals and, and the services sector. Maybe, maybe negotiations would be a little bit easier without the UK, but that is mere speculation um, from my side here. Thank you, Cora. Um, we have a question that uh, is maybe a little more technical. Um, is the EU insisting on an evergreen clause uh, additional to TRIPS as applicable to the pharma sector? Um, Morali, uh, do, do you know anything about this? Uh, well, it's uh, an uneducated guess at best. So I would, uh, evergreening is something that's not legally allowed, first of all. I mean, evergreening is, is like, uh, I mean, a terminology which I understand similar to that of greenwashing, that um, you try to extend the patent by making minor changes to the molecule which is over which you have a patent. Um, but the question is, is this change something that is so significant that you can get a patent extension? Now, this is something which most pharma, uh, pharma companies do practice. Um, if that is, if something like this is explicitly dealt in the intellectual property discussion, that is something that I'm not aware of. But I doubt if this is something that that people would negotiate on. Uh, I think uh, to add to that, I think uh, the Indian side would probably want to push this compulsive licensing, um, especially on drugs which are not affordable to the majority of Indian population. And this is something which companies like Novartis have contested all the way up to the Supreme Court in India and lost. And that's also one reason I think this arbitration issue would stand in the way of a free trade agreement because India would not want to give up the arbitrary, um, I mean, would not want to subject itself to uh, an arbitration process outside its boundaries. Thank you, Morali. Um, we've also had a, a question how uh, the recent uh, decision of the European Court of Justice 
um, that clarified, um, well, the matter at hand uh, the court was dealing with was the EU-Singapore free trade area, but it helped to clarify a more fundamental point at which levels in European governance um, mixed trade agreements have to be voted for. Um, so the question is relating to this, asking um, whether this would have any impact on the design of a sustainability chapter in the trade negotiations. Morali, do you think you can uh, chip in or maybe Cora as well, whoever of you thinks best place to answer this? Uh, honestly, I cannot hazard a guess on this uh, because I'm okay. wondering if India is a party to the Paris Treaty, uh, then how does uh, another free trade agreement come on top of it or the battle to it? That's something that I honestly can't hazard a guess on. Sorry. Right. It um, uh, looks like we, we have to um, leave this question open. Uh, there is one question about patent rights. Um, and how these would be affected by a free trade area. Again, of course, that is something that is, is very detailed and subject to negotiations. I'm not sure if we have, if we are able to hazard a guess, but uh, let me ask our two experts, Cora and uh, Morali, whether, whether you have anything to say on this. You know, I think, I'm, unfortunately, I won't be able to add much on the technicalities of uh, mm -hmm. patent rights. Right. Um, yes, I think we've dealt with the questions we have received so far. Um, um, if, uh, Christian, if I could just interpret, I think yeah. there is a question on um, uh, on EU um, movement of people. What competence does the EU really have to negotiate something India is right. asking for? Yes. Um, uh, that's something that I can try to answer because EU as such does not have any judicial uh, competence to do that because individual countries are the ones who, who finally give the blue card even though it's called the EU card. Um, although it allows free movement of the card holders to travel within the EU, uh, I'm not sure work permit uh, is something that is transferable across the countries. Now um, from my understanding or my discussions with uh, the German side and the Indian side, the German side, um, they view movement of people not as a part of any trade agreement because trade normally uh, is restricted to uh, movement of capital and goods. Um, so they do not want to mix these two things and India would want to mix two, two things and I don't think there is even uh, an agreement of having that as a point to negotiate on because um, I think they are fundamentally very different perspectives on both sides. And actually after the refugee crisis, I'm not so sure um, if uh, EU governments are willing to let go of their visa and border controls um, and to be decided at the European level. All right, thank you very much. Um... As, as far as I can see, there are no further questions. So, um, unless someone has any... Oh, there's a new new one popping up. Let me have a look at it. Um, right, this is probably something um, you, Morali, are best placed to answer. The question is that India has a free trade agreement with Japan and which might be the lessons learned from this uh, free trade agreement. Yeah, uh, I think I can add very briefly something to that because um, this is one of the reasons why Indians are still very skeptical of free trade agreements because there has been um, a couple of them with ASEAN or you know, with, uh, Japan is called the SEPA, so Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, I mean, it's all been done with on paper. Uh, but this has not led to a huge growth in, in, in Indian exports to Japan. So, uh, the, I mean, I think in, in January this year, there was a press conference where the, uh, Nirmala Sitaraman, who is a, a trade and industry minister of India, together with the Japanese minister, where uh, she was uh, expressing doubts in terms of job creation and, and growth and exports through trade deals because India did not witness, um, did not actually see the growth numbers which were projected before signing the agreement. Of course, in terms of investments, because um, 
it's just not about exports and import but in terms of investment there has been significant um, growth in Japanese investments in India and through that of course uh, job creation but uh, India has not seen um, tremendous growth in exports through the sector Thank you, Morali. Um, right. Um, I think we, we have dealt with most of the questions and we are getting close to uh, the end of our time. There's one last question um, on which I might hazard a guess. The question was whether there's any other trade agreement that has been hanging in the air for uh, something like 10 years. And, uh, well, I think, as, as most people know, most uh, trade negotiations actually take a rather long time. Um, especially, I mean, the, the most recently signed agreement between the EU and Canada took seven years to negotiate. So, yes, at the time might be unusually long, but uh, especially since um, negotiations are a bit long, but it's, it's not absolutely exceptional. And, of course, nothing would impeach uh, the negotiations from resuming. So, thank you very much for your attention and for your lively participation in the questions. Um, if you would like to have a closer look at the study, you can download them from the pages of the GET project. And uh, I hope to see you again soon.